Hey guys, welcome back. So today, working on this Generac GP7500E. Uh, this machine was given to the channel by Ken of Ken Small Engine, and it's actually a customer's machine. When it started running poorly, Ken took a look at it and diagnosed it as having a bad camshaft. Anyway, at the time I received this, I actually had three GP7500Es in non-running condition, and I decided to use this as a parts machine. So I donated the power head to another Generac that needed it. So we got that up and running. I made a video on that. And I also have another in need of an engine. That generator engine got waterlogged and is severely damaged. So it's not rebuildable, but I think this one is. So my hope is I can swap in a new camshaft and get this engine up and running again. And then we'll do an engine swap and save that other Generac. So let me get set up a little bit better and get going on this. I'm actually gonna start by getting the air box off. Uh, the reason for that is because the air box tends to drag on the ground once you get the engine off the frame. And most likely it's just gonna break if you don't take it off. Anyway, that air filter is shot, so we'll have to replace that. And actually the front cover is broken and so is the back here too. So this air box actually is junk. So I'll have to steal the air box from the other machine once we get this one up and running. Anyway, you can see right here, there's a lot of soot around the intake. And that's what Ken said he saw was that the exhaust was coming out the intake. And the reason for that is because the exhaust lobe is what's worn on this machine. So, you know, the engine works properly as far as taking air and fuel in. It ignites the air and fuel, but then it can't go out the exhaust. So when the stroke comes around, the intake opens back up, the exhaust was coming out in the wrong direction. So that is what we need to fix here. So I'm going to drain the oil from the engine. We'll see how bad it looks. You know, my main concern here is that the cam lobe, as it wore down, sent metal throughout the engine. And the new camshaft is about $150, which I think that's fine to spend on this engine. But if it needs a new connecting rod or new bearings, then yeah, this suddenly becomes unattractive because the cost can easily double to $300, maybe even 400 And it's actually a lot cheaper to find a generator that doesn't make power, but has a good engine. Usually you can pick those up for about a hundred, maybe $200. So if a new camshaft will save it, great. You know, if it needs much more than that, then yeah, I'm gonna have to second guess the approach here. So far the oil's looking decent. So while that's draining, I'm gonna get this battery uninstalled because it's tethering it to the frame and that battery's junk anyway. So it just needs to be recycled. The oil actually looks pretty good. I don't see any gray metallic in it, no shiny specks. Uh, that said, I do know that Ken changed the oil at one point during his troubleshooting, and he said there were metal shavings in there. So yeah, I'm sure there's some still inside that block. So we'll have to clean it out pretty well when we get it opened up. And before we can 
get this engine off, we have to disconnect these wires coming down from the control panel. So we've got a total of four. Uh, these two, I believe, are part of the shutdown because this black wire looks like it's connected over to the coil. So that'll kill spark when you shut that ignition switch off. And then we have another black wire from the oil sensor, which is also tied in to the coil to ground that out so that spark is shut down. Now we have two more here. One of them is a charging wire, and the other one must be to energize the solenoid for the electric start. So we'll get that loose, and then we should be free. So this post here connects right to the battery. So there's always positive power here. And that's running through this wire right to the solenoid. So I'm thinking this is a negative switched starting solenoid. So we'll have to keep that in mind because the other Generac GP7500E that I'm gonna swap this engine onto, although it's the same model, it's not the same submodel. And, you know, there could be little differences like how the solenoid is switched, whether it's positive switched or negative switched. And lastly, we just need to disconnect this guy. So we are now free from the control panel. And we should be able to just lift this right out. I think before getting this engine cover off, we'll just get some of this loose stuff out of here. Maybe brush it a bit. This stuff is just gonna fall in the engine if we're not careful. Although it can't be worse than the metal that's already in there. It looks like there's about seven bolts here holding this end cover on. There's two in here, one on the left side, two on the bottom, and then two on the right side. actually looks pretty good in here, all things considered. I was expecting a bunch of metal down here. And instead, I just see some really black oil. And if you move it around, you can kind of see that gray color in there. So that 
is the camshaft. It wore down to a fine powder. And yeah, that's really the issue here. We just don't have enough of a lobe left for this engine to function properly. Now, the first thing I noticed actually when I pulled the cover off was the counterbalancer. There does seem to be some corrosion and rust on here. And if that broke off, that could have been the abrasive that led to the cam failure. So we'll have to clean that up really well, as well as the rest of the block. Now, ideally, I would take everything apart and clean it very thoroughly. You know, in this case, I can't find the torque specs for the connecting rod. So I kind of fear that I might do more damage than good by taking that apart. So I might leave that intact and we'll just clean it the best that we can. Anyway, I did check the ball bearings over here and uh, surprisingly, they're good. You know, they're not making any noise. They're not binding. So, you know, we'll clean those out as well. We do have some more corrosion or rust kind of on the outer race here. So we'll have to get that you know, as clean as we can, but I think this is a viable rebuild candidate. So uh, let's get the cam out. we we'll take a closer look at that lobe as well as the counterweight. I just want to find the timing marks before I start pulling this stuff out. You know, I think I see one right there and I'm not really seeing the same on the counterbalance weight. So let's just rotate the engine until that mark is over there. And then we can see where the mark is on the other side. So those marks are aligned, the cam versus that gear right there. Now the counterweight, it does have a timing mark and it's not currently meshed with a timing mark on that gear. So I think what we need to do is get the cam out first and then rotate the engine until those marks align and then we can get that counterweight out. So let's start with the cam. And that's the exhaust lobe down there. You can see it's pretty much round. Not much of a lobe left on that. And the intake, there is still a lobe there. Uh, there is somewhere, but not nearly as bad. Anyway, this part, besides the worn lobes, it actually looks pretty good. There is no rust on it. Uh, let's take a look at the lifters. This is the lifter for the exhaust bit of rust and a little bit rough. Let's take a look at the lifter for the intake. Yeah, a lot more rust. So yeah, there was definitely moisture in this engine. Anyway, I did get new lifters as well as new cam. So that will not be an issue going forward. Uh, let's rotate this to the other marks line up, which should be right about there. Yep. So we'll get this weight out. And it actually looks pretty good. Not much additional corrosion besides a little bit that's right there and a little bit on this side as well. But the overall condition actually looks to be pretty good. And we also have a ball bearing in the back. Again, a little corrosion on the top outer race. Bearing itself feels pretty good. So yeah, all things considered, you know, things are looking pretty good. We just need to clean this very thoroughly before putting it back together. So I'm going to start here on the engine cover, just knock the rust off the outer race on both these ball bearings and the governor, you know, it seems to work fine, but there is some sludge buildup as well, probably bits of that metal. So I'm just going to use the WD-40 to help break that up. You know, once all this stuff is broken off, this whole thing is just going to be washed with soap and water. We'll get everything flushed out and then just re-oil those ball bearings.
That should do. And you got to switch these razor blades out quite often. They become dull fast. Anyway, you get the idea. It's cleaning up pretty well. You know, it does need more work though. There is junk in here. We need to clean out the oil fill area and clean up the governor. So I'm gonna work at this a bit longer and then I'll move on. kind of second guessing my approach on this one. Initially, I didn't want to take this engine apart thinking I would do more harm than good. But after cleaning up the cover here, you know, there was just a ton of debris and fine grit that came out of here. And with the crankshaft installed, you know, I really can't do the proper job cleaning this up. And I think the only chance this motor has is to be cleaned as properly as possible. And I think that's a little bit less important than getting the torque specs completely correct. You know, worst case, this is a clone of a Honda GX390, and I'm sure Honda GX390 specs will get us close enough. So with that in mind, let's turn this engine around. We'll get the flywheel off and uninstall this crankshaft.
All right, let's give this a try. You know, I've got two pretty good harmonic balancer kits and they come with an assortment of hardware. Neither one had anything that would fit these threads. Usually it's an M8, 1.25. In this case, I'm not sure what these are. I'm thinking they're M5, maybe M6. Uh, these bolts that I'm using, I grabbed out of a bin and they're different lengths. So we had to come up with a bunch of spacers to kind of even things out. So this may not work especially since it seems like they only spin in about three turns. All right, let's give it a try. It worked, and that's a good thing because it was on there pretty tight. I think we got the top one loose. And the bottom one. bad. Surprisingly, the cap is in excellent condition. It looks almost brand new and same for the journal and the connecting rod. So that was my biggest fear. I mean, those bits from the camshaft could have easily chewed that up. Uh, thankfully, that's not the case. As far as the crankshaft goes, not too bad. You know, not as perfect though. There is some corrosion on the outer race on the ball bearing. You know, that said, the bearing seems to be good. It's very quiet, not binding, and there's no play, so. I think we got lucky there. As far as the main journal goes, you can see some visible marks, but none of them can be felt. So yeah, things are looking pretty good, I would say. Let's see if we can get this oil sensor out of the way. That should be fine. We don't need to completely remove it. I just wanted to gain access to the mess behind there.
So I cleaned off all the debris and re-oiled the crank pretty well. So one last thing I want to try is just polishing the journal with some 1500 grit and then 3000 grit. I want to see if I can get that mirror finish back. Yeah, it's looking a lot better. So I'm going to do that a few more times. Don't want to go crazy. But it is a definite improvement. So I think we're at the point where we can start putting this thing back together. You know, everything's been cleaned, all the rust bits have been knocked off, and everything washed out and re-oiled. So let's get it back together and see if it runs. I'm just going to start with the low oil switch. Now the Honda specs I'm using actually don't list the torque spec for this. Uh, so I'm also cross-referencing to a Rato engine manual for a 420cc Honda clone. And that one does specify 8 newton meters, which is about 70 inch-pounds. Actually, I'm going to back this up a little. Although I did oil this, I'm going to use some assembly lube. That's going to stick right to the journal. And we don't have to worry about starting the engine immediately. It should stay there for a while. And we'll do the same for the connecting rod and the cap. According to Honda, this should be brought up to 120 inch-pounds, and Rato says 130. So I'm going to split the difference. We'll go 125, uh, but first I'm going to just bring it up 
to 40 before proceeding to the 125. Let's just rotate the engine, make sure there's no binding. And we're good. Do the counterbalancer first. So I'm just rotating until this timing mark is roughly where it needs to be. And we'll do the same thing. We'll just put assembly lube on each of these journals, get some on this gear, and we should be ready to install. And we've got two brand new lifters. So it doesn't matter where they go. They are the same part, whether it's the intake or the exhaust. You can see these look a million times better than the ones that came off of there. So we'll just add some assembly lube. And you do want to use assembly lube for these because it's very sticky and it holds the lifter in place, usually long enough to get the camshaft in. And finally we have the new camshaft. It's the first time I'm looking at it, probably should have looked at it sooner, make sure it's the right part. Which it seems to be, you know, it's in good condition. We do have two well-defined lobes. So let's measure these up real quick. See how these compare to the one that we pulled out of here. So we'll start with the intake. That's 1.27 inches, which is about 33 millimeters. And if we do the same, Twenty nine point eight millimeters or one point one seven inches. So, yeah, that one was worn a bit. And of course, the exhaust valve. Complete mess on the old cam. One point zero eight inches. Which is twenty seven and a half millimeters. And on the new cam. We're at 32.1 millimeters, which is about 1.25 inches. So yeah, pretty big difference. Get a bit of oil here on the compression release. Okay, and the timing mark is right there. Perfect. 
Perfect. One last check of the timing marks before we get this end cover on. You can see that dot right there on the crankshaft is aligned with the camshaft. So let's rotate the engine a bit. We'll double check the counterbalancer timing, which should be right there. And yeah, that dot, it's aligned with that one. So we are perfectly timed. These are just the locating pins. Their main purpose is to align the end cover to the crankcase, but they're also pretty useful for holding that gasket in place. In the end cover, all the ball bearings, they've been oiled as well as the governor. And we got plenty of oil here on the inner race as well as that oil seal. So for Lucky, this will just go right on. And a lot of times you got to rotate the engine to get everything to mesh properly. There we go. So the key is still in the crankshaft, and it's actually in there pretty good. It's a little crooked, but it was like that before. And just be sure to put the cup on the right way. It is keyed. There is an extra hole right there, which corresponds to that right there, that little stud sticking out of the fan. And if you do it the wrong way, it's not gonna work right. So let's torque this down. According to Honda, 83 foot pounds. Starter is going to get me here. I was hoping to use the strap wrench to hold that flywheel still while I torque this down. Unfortunately, that's not going to work for a couple reasons. First, the starter's in the way and the strap doesn't fit underneath it. So that's easy enough to remove, just two bolts right there. But the bigger issue is that this piece right here is too wide and it's going to press really hard against that plastic fan and crack it. So this is not an option to hold the crankshaft still while torquing down that nut. So instead, I'm gonna put rope in the cylinder. You know, I've rotated the engine so that the piston's at the bottom of the compression stroke. So it's all the way down. The idea is you just feed rope in there until the cylinder is reasonably full. And then when you rotate the engine, the piston pushes against that rope and it can't come to top dead center. So it locks up the crankshaft and then you can torque it down to, in this case, 83 foot pounds.
And right now the rope, it's all compressed at the top between the piston and the head. So you do need to back the engine up to bring that piston back down. And then you should be able to pull the rope right out. And I'm gonna throw a bit of oil in there because the rope kind of acts like a sponge. And it's also been four or five years since this engine has run. So the top end is pretty dry and adding a bit of oil, it's always a good idea. So to set the gap on most ignition coils, you hold the coil back like I just did, snug down the bolts. So now there's a pretty big gap between the ignition coil and the flywheel. And I say big, it's probably like 20 thousandths, maybe 30, uh, but the gap should be 10 thousandths. And most business cards are just that. So the idea is you slip the card in like that, and then you just loosen the bolts. The magnet will pull the coil in, and then you snug the bolts back up. On this engine, technically it should be 11 Newton meters, which converts to about 97 inch pounds. And I will be the first to admit, torquing an ignition coil, not that important. In fact, most engines, those bolts are very small. And 97 really seems like a lot to me. You know, I usually don't go much above 70, so I'm gonna torque it to 70. And then rotate the engine at least one revolution. Make sure that flywheel doesn't come in contact with the coil. And in this case, we're good. Getting pretty close here. We just need to set the valve clearance. And actually before that, I need to put the push rods in. I actually took the push rods out before even turning the camera on. So, you know, with a new cam, new lifters, the clearance is gonna be way off. Looks like that lifter might be up. So I'm gonna rotate the engine. Just make sure it's all the way down. And there it should be down. These are super tight. So let's back off the clearance right now. Not sure if I'm at top dead center, so let's rotate the engine. So intake just opened and closed. And actually we just passed the compression stroke, so we're coming around again. Now the piston should be coming up. And I'm gonna bring it up just a touch past top dead center. 
which is right there. Tiny bit of clearance on the intake and actually a tiny bit on the exhaust as well. So we might actually be kind of close. Uh, Generac recommends six thousandths on the intake and actually a six feels pretty good and an eight doesn't fit. On the exhaust, they recommend eight thousandths. And surprisingly, that feels pretty good. So let's just double check. It is plus or minus a thousandth. So technically, if the nine fits, you know, we might still be okay. And it does not. So it would actually seem like the exhaust valve is within spec. Let's try a seven on the intake. And the seven does not fit. So yeah, the valves are actually perfect. And as far as the carb goes, I'm going to put this one on. I had this in a bin. I have no idea its condition. But what I do know is that the carb that came out of here, it was covered in soot and carbon. So, you know, could it be cleaned up to run again? I would say so. But there's really no need because eventually I'm going to be putting this engine on another generator frame replacing an engine and that one actually has a known good carb it also has a good air box so i'm going to leave the air box off for now you know that's stuff we can swap in later when we get to that point And let's get these wires reconnected. So this is for the starter or the solenoid for the electric start. This wire here is from the ignition. This one from the oil module. So if I connected it like this, the oil system would shut the generator down when we have low oil, but then we're completely skipping the switch up above to shut the engine off manually. So instead we will go like that. So that goes up to the control panel. This comes down from the control panel and that connects over to the ignition coil to kill spark. And then we have these two wires here. One of them, actually both of them, go to the positive terminal, which should have the red wire going down to the battery.
So call me paranoid, but I'm going to add a little zinc to this oil. Now, the oil I use, it does have zinc in it, but it's only about half the amount recommended for a flat tappet cam. And to be honest, I don't usually worry about that in small engines because the springs, the spring force on the valves, it's quite a bit less than you'd find in an automobile, and worn cams is not something you usually see. You know, that said, when putting this engine back together, I noticed the exhaust valve spring required a lot more force than normal for an engine this size to open. So I think that might be a pretty big contributor as far as what caused the wear, that, and contamination, and a flat tappet cam. So I put in about 10 milliliters, which should be enough for an engine this size. So what do you think? Is it going to run? I hope so. You know, the carb, it is unproven, but I guess the good news is I turned the fuel valve on and I was going to say it took fuel and wasn't flooding over, but yeah, it's flooding over. So off to a bad start. So instead of messing around with this carb, like I said, the engine that this is replacing has a good carb. So I'm not going to clean this one at this time. Really, I just want to test the engine. You know, make sure it sounds good, that it's not going to fly apart. You know, we don't have a knock or something else. So instead, I do have a carb that Spencer sent me back in April. He is a subscriber who ordered a carb kit for his North Star, which actually had an OEM Honda on it. And the carb he got, I think it's a clone, and it should work fine on this engine. I guess the biggest difference is the choke mechanism is different, uh, but for testing, that should not matter. Okay, let's turn the fuel back on. And I guess while we wait for the carb to fill, you know, this is what I was talking about right here. So there's actually supposed to be a plate here with an auto choke, and that's why this choke lever looks different. So, you know, it shouldn't be a big deal. You know, I think the choke will stay open once we put it in that position. You know, if not, we can rig something up to kind of hold it where it should be. All right, I think we're good. It's been a few minutes, fuel's turned on and no leaks. So yeah, I've got to admit, it does look a little odd running a generator without the generator part, but this end housing, it's kind of critical to supporting the exhaust. That's why I added that in there. And I left this board as well to support the engine so that the engine's not being supported just by this exhaust pipe here. Anyway, the plan is, to run this for about 20 minutes at 2500 rpm that'll let the camshaft break in and once we're done 
I'm going to bring the engine speed back up to where it should be. Now, I've already taken some tension off this spring, so the engine's going to start and run slow. Once it's running, we'll put a tachometer on it, set the speed, and just let it run. All right, here goes nothing. We'll turn the ignition on. Choke's already on. So, we should be good to start. Maybe. So it just ran pretty well for 25 minutes. So I think we have a good engine here. Uh, to be sure though, let's drop the oil and just make sure it's not contaminated with metal. Yeah, not good. Yeah, the oil is not perfect. I can see metallic in it, and if I mix it around, you can really see it. There is some sparkly bits in there. So I guess the big question is, is that from the cam break-in? Is that old stuff that I maybe didn't clean out enough? Or do we have bigger issues here? So I am going to refill with oil. I'll just run it for another 25 to 30 minutes. We'll drop the oil again, see if it looks any better. Let's try it again. We've got fresh oil in the engine. So we'll get it started. I'm gonna back the engine speed off a bit, maybe closer to 3000 RPM and just let it run. And we'll check back.
So the ignition switch is not working, or maybe I wired it up the wrong way. But that is not my concern right now. Let's see if this oil looks any better. Much, much better. That is a pretty big improvement. You can actually see to the bottom of the oil pan, the oil color is good. And more importantly, there is absolutely no metallic in that oil. So I think we're looking pretty good. And I've got to say, I was a little nervous when I saw this. I was expecting some metallic in the oil, not quite as much as we got. And wanted to make sure that we didn't have an active problem. And in this case, I think it's a combination of some old material from the camshaft that wore out originally and the new one breaking in. At any rate, I am feeling pretty good about this engine now. And it just goes to show you how important it is to change that oil. There's no oil filter on these. So if you don't change the oil, especially on a newer engine or a rebuilt engine, that stuff's just gonna circulate it's going to wear down the engine and the engine's going to wear out sooner than it should. Anyway, I think I'm going to wrap the video here. Jason actually took back his GP7500 after the last repair attempt. So I'm going to do a follow-up video on that, swapping this engine in. And with any luck, we'll finally turn his lemon into lemonade. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.